Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters. I'm Ura Rafaya. We are going to go ahead and start the Parashah Yitro. In this Torah portion, we're going to explore some of the things that we may or may not have heard before. And this happens to be when the Creator came down and contracted the heavens and earth on Mount Sinai. Very important uh, Torah portion. And we are going to go ahead and start off right away um, this to our portion. This to our portion, Yitro, not only gives us the momentum to understand why it's called Yitro, but at the same time, we will study some of the things that, um, that might be obscured for us. So let's jump in right away. Parashah Yitro is in Shemot 18, verse 1, all the way to uh, 20, verse 23. And Yitro, the Kohen of Miriam, Moshe's father-in-law, heard everything that he had say. He have to say, "A ye Almighty have done for Moshe and for Israel his people, as Yahweh had brought Israel out of Misraim or Egypt." Right off the bat, says very clear that Yitro happens to be Moshe's father-in-law. But as we study in the previous to our portions in the past. We learned that before he became his father-in-law, he happens to be a very suspicious man. And I understand that. I mean, we all have the, I mean, even ourselves, we are very suspicious by nature. But in, in, the, uh, in Yitro's case, at that time, I mean, he has so many names. One of them is Ruil. And I want you to understand that Ruil or Yitro was happens to be one of the counselors of Pharaoh. And one of the reasons why he went back to his native country, which is Medium, is because when he has something to say for Israel, for our forefathers in Egypt, Pharaoh wasn't very pleased to hear those good, favorable uh commentaries or um, counsel and so that's one of the reasons why Yitro decided to go back because he felt very embarrassed by the pharaohs um, mocking um, um, response so now we see here that he established himself back again in medium and more shall we learn how he wound up 10 years in Yitro's uh, medium's uh, place because Yitro put them on prison for 10 years and we learn also that his daughter Yitro's daughter actually believed in Moshe's you know story because of course everybody knew Moses or Moshe's story how he, uh, he was um, in Egypt and after that he fled and he went up in um, somewhere in Assyria and from Assyria, he became a warrior. He was already a warrior by nature, but he became a king afterwards, after 40 years. And after that, they let him go because they didn't want, he did not want to marry the queen. And that's one of the reasons why I let, them, let him go with gifts and, you know, good favorable um, sight in the, uh, the eyes of the Assyrians. But once again, we go back to Yitro. He did not believe any of that. That's why he put him on, on jail for 10 years to rot and die. So that's basically summed up the story of Yitro's and Moshe's crossing path. Now let's go back over here. Now Yitro's seeing all the power of Yahweh's, how he performed all the signs and wonders in Egypt. And now that they cross over to this side, to Arabia, where Miriam is at, we see how uh, Yitro seen all the pattern of uh, Yahweh's power and signs and wonders. And now he understands, now he believes everything that, you know, the Moshe have said from day one. It was true. Now, he happens to be one of the people who uh, converted into to our our forefathers, you know, Torah and everything. He happens to be one of them, not the only one. Um, Batiyah, which happens to be also 
uh, Moses, uh, Moses, my adopted uh, mother, and so forth. There were so many. So it's just an example of how many people they actually convert into Israel. Now, let's continue. Exodus or Shemuel 18, verse 2, after Moshe had sent away his spouse, Zephora, and their two sons, Moshe's father-in-law, Yitro, took them back. Now, the reason why I'm a little bit fast forward is because now, if there is a reason, and I know I've seen so many commentaries, uh, um, our Jewish brothers, where they made these comments with their, where Moshe um, divorced his wife, and then he marry another wife, which happens to be not true because we will see why he actually sent them back to his father's uh, house. And the reason for it is because I want you to see and we'll make things out, out of all these verses and it makes so much sense. For verse 20 of Exodus, so Moshe took his sw spouse and children, mounted them on the beast, which is the the donkey and went out from Israel or Egypt. Moshe took the rod of Yil Almighty in his hand. See, when well, he was already on his way to, back to uh, Egypt, he was ready to go. Not only that, uh, Yahweh in the Torah so it says very quick, very, very clear that Yahweh spoke to Acharon and told him go over there to the the desert and and meet your brother in Mount Sinai where you guys are going to come back with uh, and bring our people back from Egypt. So that's pretty much the, so the, the story is summed up. But something happened in the way back to Egypt. I want you to see it next. Let's first, let's go into Targun Yonatan on Exodus 18 verse 2. And Yitro, mother's father-in-law, took Sephora, his wife, who Moshe have sent back after he have gone to Misraim. Also, the Targun Yonatan says this, this. But I want you to see something very uh, uh, detailed here. Why? Book of Yashar 79, verse 15. Nacharon lift up his eyes and saw Sephora, Moshe's wife, and his sons, and said to Moshe, Who are these to you? And Moshe said to him, these are my wife and my children, whom Yahweh gave me in Miriam. The thing afflicted that because of the woman and her children. Now, I want you to ask yourselves, brothers and sisters, why in the world he was afflicted? Why was he concerned, in other words, about Moses and the wife and children? And the reason for it is because, once again, let me go kind of repeat that once again all the wonders and signs that Yahweh made through Moses and the Harons in the eyes of the Egyptians and also our forefathers in Egypt were in the period of almost a year is because of the yearly cycle of the seasons and everything Yahweh utilized the seasons to show his power throughout the Egyptians within yeah a little bit closer or a little bit more than a year so here we understand why he was kind of concerned. And the reason why he was concerned is because he was going to put in, um, in the middle of danger. So why put more weight and more, uh, more worry into Moses? He's not going to perform the way he's supposed to. Might as well have him back to his, um, his father-in-law where he's going to be safe then over there in the other side. So that's one of the reasons why he was very smart of Acharon, Moshe's brother, to give him that advice to send him back and would be much better and no worries whatsoever. Now, on the way back, he need him back again. So he never, if you really think about it, he never um, gave a, a letter of uh, divorce to his wife. Rather, he, he just put him in a safe place where he wasn't going to be worried about them. So let's go and continue. Exodus 19.10 So Yahweh said to Moshe, Go to the people today and tomorrow and set them aside for me 
by having them wash their clothes. I'm going a little bit fast forward, brothers and sisters, because I want you to understand how we understand now about Yitras. We understand now about Moshe and the wife. Now we go fast forward in, in the third month, in the first day, Yahweh said 19, chapter 19, where they meet on that very first day of the third month. And Yahweh said, within three days, I will come down. I want you to have them prepare because I will come down. Yahweh was able to contract the heavens and earth and it's something not to be taken lightly. The reason for it is because Yahweh's mighty power cannot contract, cannot, I mean, the, the universe it's, or universes in plural cannot contain Yahweh's power. And that's how amazing our creator is. So why, let's go back over here, why having them wa uh, wash their clothes? That's another form of si I'm saying, having made uh, tevila, which is immersion. Having prepared, because you have to understand, the, it was a form, it was a way of making them know, hey, you will, th th there will be weddings coming down within three days. It's like a spouse that is getting ready and having uh, the, the wife ready to, or the bride ready for the groom. Very, very amazing. Let's continue. I want you to understand that these three days that Yahweh is setting uh, for our people, for us, even remember what I said, and let me just pause here for a moment, brothers and sisters. Remember that what it was, chapter Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 9, it says very clear that what it was, it will be again. The history repeats itself. Yahweh said, I will come down within three days. This is a pattern that we see over and over again in the scriptures, all over. There is always a principle. There is always a, a pattern. In this case, within three days happens to be after the Mashiachs in the fourth millennium. Let me go back over here so I can explain you. We see that there are 6,000 6, millenniums, right? We are literally in the middle, or almost at the end of the 6,000 millennium. We understand this is the first millennium after the fall of Adam. This is the second, the third, the fourth millennium where the Mashiach came. And then he says three days after, we know that the fifth millennium came. We know that the sixth millennium, which we are in the middle of it right now. And, this, and the third millennium, which is the seventh millennium, is coming. That's where Mashiach will come. Remember what the scripture says, in two days, I will give you, I will give you life. In the third day, I will resurrect you. We are in the middle of the six, actually at the end of the 6,000 millennium. In the Hari Hayami, which happens to be the last era. We are literally witnessing a lot of things that our forefathers did not. And they did, and we didn't. So it goes back and forth. We are in the very, very last threat of the 6,000 millennium, which means that we need to be prepared. The third day is coming where Mashiach will return. Remember that there will be weddings of the Lamb? We know that for a fact. Revelation 20, 19 and 20 says very clear, And I saw Jerusalem or Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a, as a bride prepared for the husband. We are the ones, brothers and sisters. Mashiach says very clear about the wedding. So we have to understand that we need to be prepared for the third day. The third day is coming. We need to wash our clothes. See, the, the um, brides, uh, is called the, uh, the wedding rehearsal. We are in the wedding rehearsal, brothers and sisters. We need to be preparing. We need to be rehearsing. Why do you think it's called Mikra? Please write it down. Mikra, M. I Q R A Mikra, which means it's called a convocation, which is uh, in English or in Spanish, 
But in, in reality, convocation, like when it says set apart convocation, right? And the festivals, the feast or Shabbat, the creator but it basically means not only that, but also mikra means a rehearsal. We are in the rehearsal, brothers and sisters, for something that is coming in the future. It's like a soldier, he rehearses. It's like anybody who's training, he's rehearsing for something because the real thing is coming. We are doing the same thing. We, we are rehearsing the Shabbat. We are rehearsing the festivals because there's something we will utilize this in the future. You see, all this has a very meaningful uh, encoded in the Torah and that's what it's all about. So we are literally about to get into the third day and let's look at some similarities uh, chapter 19 verse 11 of Exodus and get ready for the third day for in the third day Yahweh will come down on Mount Sinai before the eyes of all people isn't it what the Torah says and also isn't it what Matthew or Shem 24 says where every eye will see him coming down from heaven Mashiach will come down every eye will see him there will be a shofar a trumpet, what they call it, right? Let's look. 19 verse 16. In the morning on the third day, there was thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud over the mountain. And then the shofar sounded so loudly that all the people in the camp trembled. You see? Something that I want you to understand. Yahweh, our creator, is very powerful. We cannot contain the power of our creator something very that was very lightly our forefathers could, couldn't even contain that's how much power our creator is and yet our forefathers were literally dying matthew 24 31 he will send his messengers with a shofar and with a loud voice to gather his chosen ones from the four winds of heaven for one end of the shemaim of the heavens to the other this is what the Mashiach will come down and what's gonna happen brothers and sisters this is gonna be a loud shofar a ram's horn that will be loud and everyone will hear from all around the world isn't it what the revelation says that will be seven shofarim or seven ram's horn we're almost at the end of the last horn which is the seventh so do you see how everything is coming together? First the Thessalonians 4.16 For the Master himself will come down from heaven with a loud shout, with a call by the chief Malak or angel, and then with the shofar of Yahweh. You see, those who have died united with Mashiach will be the first to be resurrected. Exactly what our forefathers experienced it's exactly what we will experience, including those, the dead of Mashiach. So no wonder why everything, what it was, it will be again. Exodus 19 verse 5. Now if you pay careful attention to what I said and keep my my covenant, then you will be my own treasure among all people. For the whole earth is mine. Now, I want you to understand this very verse, brothers and sisters, because to begin with, our forefathers, the whole nation, was set to be a kehunat. Kehunat is basically a priesthood, the whole nation, and also kings. That's what it was set. Chapter 19, verse says very clear. What happens in the middle of it? Our forefathers sinned. They made a golden calf. You know that. Everybody knows. And that's one of the reasons why there's supposed to be four crowns. The crown of the good name, the crown of the Torah, the crown of the land, and the crown of the priesthood. Out of those four crowns, two were left after the uh, sin of the golden calf, uh, golden calf which the only one that was, was kept to our forefathers was 
the crown of the good name and the crown of the land. The other two were not given and we will get it back by our Mashiach, the four back. But before that, it was taken from our fathers because of the golden sieve, golden calf sin. Let's continue. Exodus 19, verse 7. Moshe came, some of all the people, all the elders of the people, present them all these words of Yahweh have commanded him to speak. All the people answer as one. And what did they say? Whatsoever Yahweh had said, we will do. Moshe reported the words of this people, of the people to Yahweh. This is what our forefathers said. They never questioned. They never asked 20 questions. They never asked if there was any benefits and insurance and if it was a PPO. Uh, nothing, brothers and sisters. We, by nature, are very suspicious and we like to ask everything. Our forefathers just said, whatsoever Yahweh has spoken, we will do. And this is what we should say. Kol asher diber Yahweh naaseh. Kol asher diber Yahweh naaseh. Whatsoever Yahweh have said, we will do. This is what should, we should be saying nowadays without faltering. Why? Because our forefathers, they said it, but they sinned. And they made this horrific thing in the eyes of Yahweh. And they were experiencing all the signs and wonders. We have not seen any of that. We should be better than our forefathers. Isn't it what Jer Jeremiah 31, 31 says in verse 32? Not like the covenant that I made with your fathers in Sinai. Because I was a husband to them. Do you see that? It makes sense everything we're saying, right? Because it was, a, it, was, it was going to be a wedding. But something happened, brothers and sisters. Moshe broke the two tablets. And those two tablets was a testament of the bedit, of the covenant. If Moses would not break, wouldn't break those tablets, we would not be speaking right now. Because he did so, that's why our Creator re make the covenant again, renew the covenant, which is berit chadashah, which is to renew the covenant once again. He's doing it through our Mashiach nowadays. This ketubah on the left side, this is a wedding contract. The the Tablets also were a wedding contract as well. And that's one of the reasons why Moshe broke them. 19 verse 13 of Exodus, no hand would touch it because he has to be stoned or killed with arrows. Neither an animal nor human will be allowed to leave. When the voices and the shofar and the sound and the clouds depart from the mountain, they can go up to the mountain. Now, if you notice here, brothers and sisters, it says very clear that after the voices, voices in plural, the shofar sound, and the clouds, all that has passed away, they could go up to the mountain. What happened after, brothers and sisters? Our forefathers could not handle the situation. Verse 16, in the morning on the third day, there was a thunder, lightning, in a thick cloud of the mountain, then the shofar sounded so loudly that all the people in the camp, what happened? Tremble. They could not handle. See, our father Yahweh Sebaot, he pronounced 10 pronunciations. Chapter 20 says very clear. It, these are, I am Yahweh, your creator, and he keeps going. This is the first, second, third, and so forth. He only said two sayings, and our fathers were dying. Remember what the Torah says, let not the Creator speak to us anymore, because if He continues, we will die. That's how powerful our Creator was. We cannot fatten how powerful in integrating our Father Yahweh could be, showing you the, His just a little bit, a taste of his power because it's so powerful 
We cannot handle it. But he just brought a little bit how he is. And we, our forefathers were already dying. Yet they survived. But the intent was for them to go up to the mountain. But what happened, brothers and sisters? They didn't. See, the command was for them to wait for all that and then go up to the mountain. Remember, this is supposed to be a wedding, right? They didn't. They couldn't handle because they were so afraid. Look at what it says. And let's look at another pattern so you see that I'm not making this up. Yahushua or Joshua, chapter 6, verse 4. Seven Kwanim priests will carry the seven shofarot or ram's horn in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, you will march around the city seven times. And the priest will sound the shofar oath. You see that? Verse 5. Then a prolonged blast of the shofar will sound. At the sound of the shofar, all the people will shout as loud as they can. And the wall of the city will fall under itself. Look what it says. After all that, then the people will go up to the city. Each one directly from where he is standing. So in other words, you see the, you see the pattern? They needed to, to sound the shofar, the sound, and everything that was around. Follow after that, they will go up. The same directions of Yahweh gave to our Moshe to give to our forefathers, and yet they didn't go up. Here, they did, of course. Yahushua chapter 6, verse 20. So the people shouted, with the shofarot sounding. When the people heard the sound of the shofarot, they let out a loud shout, and the wall fell to the ground. And after that, so the people went up to the city. Do you see that? The people went up to the city because it was a direction, the right direction that was given to them. Our fathers did not follow the direction. That's why Yahweh, after that, because they were so afraid, and to go out there, Yahweh said, okay, let them stay where they are. If they keep touching, they will die. So that's one of the reasons they remain where they were. Exodus 19, verse 6. You will be a kingdom of Kwanim to me, a priesthood, a nation set apart. These are the words that must, must speak to the sons of Israel. This was the direction to begin with, brothers and sisters, that our father, father's whole nation was going to be a kingdom, a priesthood, kehunot, all of them, and also set apart nation. That was destined for us. But because of the golden sin, that was not, it was taken out from us. Now, through our Mashiach, is we regaining back again, but with a better benefits, which is not the, uh, not the lineage of the, the Lewi, but rather a better one, which is a higher attribute, which is the, li the line of Melchizedek. Remember, they have three attributes. It's because Lewi only has one attribute, to be a priest. But the higher attributes on uh, Melchizedek is because he's a king, a priest and a prophet. You see that? A higher calling because of Mashiach. He's following the same pattern as it was intended in the very beginning. Let's look at uh, what story repeats itself again, brothers and sisters. And this happens to be the northern kingdom, the house of Israel, Ephraim. First of Kings 12, 28, after seeking counsel, the king made two golden calves and said to the people, You have been going up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold, your Elohim, your gods, your demons, Yisrael, who brought you out of the land of Misraim. Wasn't it the same thing that Acharon said to our fathers in the wilderness, brothers and sisters? In this time, it was a double whopper. You see that? It wasn't one golden calf. It was two. I mean, we never, as people we never learn our lesson and that's one of the reasons why Ephraim is very stubborn that's one of the signs of uh, uh, Ephraim the northern kingdom as a 
uh, donkey. You know, donkeys are very stubborn, right? That's one of the reasons why we are the donkeys. We are so stubborn people, we never learn. Verse 16, they forsook all the misbots of Yahweh, their almighty, a you. They made images of molten calf, even two calves made of Nashira, worship the whole army of the heavens, Shemayim, and serve who? Baal. We have inherited throughout so many years everything our forefathers did in the past, which is idolatry, which is vanity. And we've been dragging it alone through our generations. It is time to stop that. And we are living in the end of the 6,000 millennium, which is the Akhari Hayami, which is the end of the, of the era. We need to make a change for better, not worse. Things are not getting any better, brothers and sisters. We need to, we need to improve. We need to improve our way of life. We need to improve the Torah, not to the nation's ways. Hosea 13, verse 2, And now they continue to sin. They made golden cuffs, golden images, atzap, which is idols, with their silver, according to their skill, all the work of craftsmen. All of them, they said, let the men who sacrifice kiss the cuffs. Do you see that? exactly what our forefathers did and we've been dragging it all along don't we remember when we were in the christian world or on the other side on the vatican where we used to worship their and kiss their saints and their you know holy mary and so forth all these saints made of um, human hands we were doing all that brothers i mean the past repeats itself. Simple as that. Look what it says. First of Kings 19 verse 18. But I will leave 7,000 in Israel. All the knees have not bowed to Baal. And every mouth has not kissed him. You see that? Exactly what we were doing before. We were bowing down to them. And we were kissing their feet. This is what the Vatican does. This is what the Christian world does. It's idolatry, in other words. And exactly what Yahweh hates so much. Job 31.26 And if I have looked at the sun when it was shining, or the moon marching in its splendor, and my heart was seduced in secret, and my hand threw a kiss from my mouth, that I will have been iniquity deserving of judgment because it will be, it will, I will have denied Yahweh Ayil Almighty. You see how the penalty is in the eyes of our Creator? Sending a kiss through our mouth is basically honoring, honoring something that had no, no breath, no, no sight, no life whatsoever. Vanity completely vanity and it will be iniquity in the eyes of Yahweh doing all these things that's one of the reasons why Yahweh begins with the second commandment first commandment said I am Yahweh the second is do not have any other worship any idols or demons except for me I am your almighty and we need to understand that our Creator deserves better than our forefathers did. We almost done. 19 verse 2. Jisrael, the word for camped is Wayicham. Wayicham means camped. And why am I bringing this verse? Is because they camped as one, as Achad, as uni, unity, as one people. So that means that the past will repeat itself once again, brothers and sisters. Look at what happened in the first century. Acts of 2 verse 1, And the days of Shabbat were fulfilled. They were with the same objective. You see that? With the same heart. They were the same heart over there in Shabbat, in the mountain. 
here, as Mashiach says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for Ruach HaKodesh, which is the inspiration of Yahweh. 20 verse 18, look at what it says, and all the people saw the Hakoloch. Hakoloch means the voices in plural, the lightning, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they tremble, standing at a distance. Here we see something with detail, and the word is chloch, which means voices in plural. I want you to see that the word kol mean, means voice or sound. Our forefathers did not only hear one voice, they heard many. How did it work? How did it happen? But then they didn't only hear it, but they saw it. How that happened, brothers and sisters? It's very amazing. Look at what happens in the book of Acts 2, verse 3. And there appeared to them tongues divided as fire. See that? Which settled upon each one of them. This happened to be fire which they saw. Which is the Ruach Kodesh, the spirit, the inspiration of Yahweh Sevaot. This is just a clear indication that this happened in the past and it will happen again, brothers and sisters. It's amazing. In Mount Sinai, Yahweh spoke not only the voice, okay, not only in Hebrew, of course, okay. But out of the Hebrew came out of the 70 tongues around the world, which means that Yahweh spoke to our forefathers in the wilderness in Hebrew. But when they were listening Hebrew, brothers and sisters, the sound that was emitting that our fathers were seeing, but not only seeing, but also listening, then something else happened. The voice or the tongue or the language of the Greek sound or the language of the Egyptians tongue on the language of the Peruvian or the Mayan, the sound of the language of who? Of the Chinese and so forth. All the 70 nations around the world. The voice of Yahweh when spoken was divided into 70 nations in 70 languages so all the nations could understand when each nation heard the voice on its own native tongue its souls were gone except for Josiah who heard it but was not hurt and exactly what happened our forefathers were spared even though they were literally in front of Mount Sinai and rather, our fathers were spared. We're almost done in closing with this. Exodus 32, verse 28, because of the golden sin, our fathers, that day, 3,000 of them died. But look at what Yahweh does. He always make Nikatikun, a correction. Book of Acts 2, verse 41, that day were added to the group around three thousand people so what Yahweh does he always replaces what is lost he always replaces everything that don't need to be there Yahweh said you know what you're replaceable we can replace it with someone else and exactly what's happening nowadays brothers and sisters those who don't want any part for to the people of Israel Yahweh said no problem there are more people that want to work with me and exactly happens everywhere, even in our own jobs. People who don't want to work, don't want to do their job, what they're supposed to, get they get fired, in other words, and they replace it with someone who has who's much better than the person who was previously. It's always like that. The same pattern never lost. Let's finish up with this. Sophaniah 3 9. For them I will change the peoples, that they may have pure lips. To call upon the name of Yahweh Sebaot, all of them, and serving under one yoke. See, in this very verse, brothers and sisters, 
is encoded the entire Hebrew alphabet. Just in this verse happens to be the name of Yahweh, happens to be uh, pure lips, which is a Hebrew. See, in the very beginning, Yahweh reverses everything. Remember that in the very beginning, uh, when they wanted to uh, make the, uh, the Tower of Babel, right? And Yahweh stopped them. Remember that they have one, uh, one language spoken. But Yahweh divided into 70 plus 1, 71. The first one is Hebrew and then the 70 nations. Now, the 70 nations are going to become one. See that? Which is Hebrew. Not because we want to. It's because it is already written that this is going to happen. In this very verse that we're seeing, happens to be the whole entire Hebrew alphabet. Our Creator is restoring everything from the very beginning. It is our mission, the North Earth Kingdom, to restore all things, brothers and sisters. It's not just our Mashiach doing all this. It's all of us. So I th truly believe that we all need to work with each other, waiting for Mashiach, waiting for the wedding that is coming soon, because it's almost at the end. I'm Ure Rafaya. We'll see you next time. Shabbat Shalom. And please, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. You can uh, get alert of coming productions that we're always working on it. Shabbat Shalom.